Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, July 9th, and it's a beautiful summer morning here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, looking forward to maybe not having thunderstorms today, but we'll see. It's, it's It gets really hot and then the rain comes down, which cools things off, so that's nice, but then everything's wet. And, you know, I, I like to go sit outside in the evenings and you can't a lot of times just because everything is wet. I guess I could dry it off, but I'm lazy. Anyway, uh, it's going to be a nice day today, so looking forward to that. Uh, but I get, I, I, so this is going to be primarily a talk about flea markets, sold tools, a couple of examples of some things I bought yesterday. Um, just fair warning, that's not, not going to be a heck of a lot of pipe-related stuff here. It's mostly going to be... Uh, some tool stuff, some interesting historical stuff, some interesting investigative uh, tool research kind of stuff. So you, you might enjoy it, or you might want to go watch something else, and that's okay too. Uh, but before we get into that, we need a pipe. And I, you know, I've been doing this thing that I started on the live streams on Friday nights, where I've got this box of, I'm calling it mystery tobacco. It's not really mystery, it's just, I don't know what I'm going to be smoking, that's the mystery. I pull out three or four, I say what they are, and the folks in the live stream vote, and that's what I smoke until it's gone. I'm trying to get rid of all these samples that I have. Uh, not that they're bad or good, it's just that I, a lot of them I haven't even tried, and they just accumulate. So, uh, Because people are kind, and they, they like to, to share uh, tobaccos, and this, this, is, this is the burden we must bear as members of this fine community, but that's okay. So, the tobacco of the week is Makua. This is a, an HU tobacco, so German made. Uh, I believe it's a Burley Virginia Perique blend, and it has a bit of a, a cocoa topping on it, is, is the way it was described. And uh, I had this, so this was, this was another sample that was sent to me by my friend Jim Finn similar to what I smoked last week, the Esoterica Dorchester. And maybe out here on my little tray. It's a, it's a nice looking blend. It's got, you know, it's a little dry right now. That's my fault. But yeah, there you go. Uh, it definitely has some Perique in the mix. And there's what appear to be Bright Virginias and Burley. And I opened this up when... Jim first sent it to me and had a bowl of it and thought, eh, not, not my thing. And so I tried it again on Friday night and again, not my thing, not bad, good quality tobacco, a topping that I'm not quite at terms with, but that's my palate. Uh, so no, no criticism of it, just not for me, you know, but Texas Piper Eddie, my, my good friend Eddie said, uh, I bet you'd like it with a cup of coffee in the morning. So, Eddie, we're going to do it with a cup of coffee in the morning. I've got my Tim Thorpe, and we will load that up. And this should pretty much finish this off. So normally I, I give the last bowl's worth of tobacco to the annual tobacco mix jar, if I like it. Um, this one, I probably would have put in there. Um, I'm not sure because it does have a topping, but I probably would have put it in there. But I only had enough to have on Friday night and then to have today on Sunday, and I wanted to talk about it. So, your gain, the tobacco jars loss, and such is life. All right, so like I said, this has a topping. It's, it's a cocoa topping. And... Uh, to me, I get a lot of sweetness and vanilla notes out of it. Strange. So you know how with American aromatics, Sorry, this is just my, my observation. Maybe this isn't true of all American aromatics, but most. 
you light them and you get this burst of flavor at the very beginning. And then that dissipates pretty quickly as you go through the bowl. Well, what does this topping taste like to me? Is that first light of something like Lane One Q? Those sort of vanilla, marshmallow kind of uh, flavored tobaccos. It doesn't diminish, so you know it's got something going for it. And uh, below that, I mean, the topping has something going for it. Not not the tobacco. The tobacco has a lot going for it. It's good quality tobacco. You can pull out. Definitely sweetness from the Virginia, a little bit of tartness, plenty of burly, um, not quite nutty, but more woody burly. And a nice, but not too uh, aggressive Perique hit on the retro hell. Yeah, so not terrible, not my thing. Uh, but if you like that sort of thing, it sounds interesting to you. Apparently it's not easy to get uh, because it is a German tobacco, but not cool. And again, thank you to my buddy Jim Finn uh, for providing me with something to talk about that's pipe related because now we're going to go into something not pipe related. So I went to the flea market yesterday. First time I've been this season. Uh, just haven't had the time. Uh, my wife, so we had to get a vacuum cleaner repaired. I repair our normal vacuum cleaners, but she brought this Rolls Royce vacuum cleaner. It's like a, I think it's called Miele. It's a French company. Um, the darn thing cost more than some cars I've owned and, uh, I don't even know how to turn it on, but she says it's the best vacuum cleaner she's ever had. She loves it. It it's like a sports car, like a, like a Porsche. You have to take it in for service every so often. Uh, well, you have to do that for any car, but with this, it's like every six months, it seems. Uh, and I have no hopes of working on it myself. I don't even know how to how to turn it on, but beyond that, how to like open it up and stuff. It's uh, yeah, it's a high end, probably over engineered vacuum. The other, we have a shark that I, I just take to pieces on, on my bench uh, once a year and clean out and everything and you put it back together and you change the belts if needed. And uh, yeah, I love that because you know, self-sufficiency and whatnot. Anyway, this has nothing to do with the flea market other than she had dropped it off for, uh, for this cleaning and everything and uh, maintenance. And she asked me if I could pick it up this morning, uh, yesterday morning. And I passed the Quaker Town farmer's market, flea market, on the way to the vacuum store. I love this place. It's a huge outdoor flea market. The picture in the front is actually from it, uh, but it's huge. It, it, it takes you a good, oh, a good hour and a half just to walk around it. Uh, you know, you, you're looking at stuff, obviously, but if, you, if you're not really interested in anything, it's going to take you about an hour and a half just to, to see every table. And if you're interested in stuff, it could take a lot longer. Plus, there was a car show going on at the same time on the other side of the, the market, so that was pretty cool. Although, I, it was really hot. By the time I got through the, the, the flea market, I was getting a little overheated, and I just I didn't have time for the car show. I didn't have time. I didn't want to put up with the heat. So, so I went through the flea market, bought a couple things, which I'll show you, and then went and picked up the vacuum and came home and avoided heat stroke, so I was happy about that. But I love going to this market, and any flea market for that matter, because you get to have these, what I'm going to call brief social encounters. And some of the people are really unique, <laughs> really unique. And some of them are, you know, very gruff and impersonable, and some of them are, you know, just nice people that you enjoy talking to. So, I always come away with a sense of people, you know. I'm not a very 
social person. I'm not somebody that's going to walk up to somebody in the grocery store and start a, a conversation. I, I just don't do that. But when you're at a flea market, you're kind of forced into these conversations, which is good for me. It gives me practice. But it also provides me with these opportunities to see people from a different angle. And, and I, I really do enjoy it. So let's get to some tools. And uh, well, let me, let me tell you one story about people. And then we'll get to the tools as an example of what I was just talking about. Um, I bought two of the items that I'm going to show you. By the way, I really blew my budget at this. I spent a total of four dollars. Um, actually, I bought all of the items from the same guy. Now that I'm thinking of it, so four dollars total. I got two items that cost one dollar each, and then one that was a whole two dollars. So I take these up to the to the fellow, and uh, he says that's four dollars. And I I go and I, I keep my money in a money clip on one of these expandable wallet things, and I pull it out. I'm trying to see if I've got a a 10 or a 5 or something because you know flea markets they don't have a bunch of ones a lot of the time and I found a 5 and I pulled out of the, the folded up money and, and hand it to him and he goes off to wherever he does his money changing and I'm tucking things back in my wallet and he comes back and he says hey you gave me two fives and he hands me back six dollars and you know I thanked him and he have a nice day and all that but I thought wow I would have had no idea. I just wouldn't have known. I didn't. There was two fives stuck together. He was out of my sight when he looked at the money. So there's absolutely no reason other than goodwill that that fellow turned around and gave me back that $5. $5 isn't that much money. I don't know what he would have done if it was $200 bills stuck together. <laughs> you know, who knows? Not that I had $200 bills that could be stuck together, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, little things like that occasionally can re renew your sense of um, the goodness of men. And, and I, I, that, was, that was kind of the highlight of my trip, that and getting me some, some cool stuff. So I don't need any tools, to be honest with you. I, I don't. I, uh, I got plenty of saws. There's actually two saws that I'd still like to get, but we won't get into that. I've got more chisels than a man needs. I've got more planes than a man needs. There's one plane I'd like to get a, a like a Stanley Seven, uh, just to use as a as a, a jointer, and uh, you know, a large smoothing uh, not smoothing plane, uh, uh, or plane. There we go. But uh, I don't need it. And beyond that, you know, clamps, screwdrivers, hammers, I'm okay. I, you know, I might pick up some clamps if I see them, but I don't need anything. So what I'm doing really is looking for stuff that's interesting. Stuff that's in bad shape that I can restore. Uh, not so bad that it can't be restored, but uh, I like doing that. And, you know, stuff that I, I say, oh, I could use that. Uh, I didn't know I needed it. So the first item I'll show you. This one, I've already cleaned this up. This was uh, in pretty bad shape. Not, 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 it, cosmetically. It was dirty and it had a lot of paint on it. I don't know why old tools always have paint on them. People must just splash paint around tools a lot. I, I don't know. But I'm always scraping paint off the of tools. You know what that is? So this has all been, I, I, I cleaned this up. Uh, didn't do anything extensive to it, but got the paint off it, a little bit of steel wool on the, on the metal parts to get some rust off, and then uh, Murphy's oil soap followed by alcohol and uh, some tongue oil, just to, just to put a little bit of a protective coating on it. So this is, where'd it go? This is a holder for these. You slide the blade in like so. Trying desperately not to cut yourself. The best way to do this is actually on the bench. And now you got the blade securely in a handle. 
why I want this is I use these single edge razor blades a lot. Um, and sometimes I'm using them to push straight down. Like when I make a Delrin tenon and, and I part it off on the lathe, there's always a little nip, nib of Delrin left that I have to slice off before I can use it. And normally I will take that blade and hold it between my fingers and just push straight down. And occasionally I just get the angle wrong and the blade will buckle on me and not buckle, but like flip. And it's pretty darn dangerous. I've never cut myself doing it on wood, but um, I can imagine getting really badly hurt doing this. And it's something I've worried about. And this solves the problem. You know, I can just, uh, not, not so much for like, this kind of cutting, but for that straight down cut, I think this is going to be really ideal. And, you know, of course the blades are disposable. That's one of the reasons I like them. Uh, and I use them for, for all sorts of things. Uh, you know, scraping. Uh, I don't know if this would work for scraping. Might just keep, keep it as a hand scraping thing. But anyway, uh, very happy to have that. And it's even got a little hole in the, in the end there for me to hang it up above the bench. So... And I will keep the blades out of it when I'm not using it. Yes, yes. I know myself. You you do your your safe stuff. I'll do mine. And believe me, I'm not a safety Nazi by any stretch, but I know I'll cut myself on that. So that was fine number one, and I was that that would have been enough. One dollar. Number two. I have not cleaned this up yet. This is exactly as I got it. And this, I thought, was a birdcage, y'all. Let me take a close look at that point. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. It's got a spear head on it. It's it's tri tri corner, so three faces. It comes to a fairly sharp point. These edges are very sharp which should have been a clue, but weren't. Um, now, birdcage all is an all that you use to start a hole. So it just, it's got sides to it, edges to it, so that it can kind of carve out that hole uh, compared to a regular awl, which is just sort of a straight point, which you don't really, turning it doesn't really do anything. Turning this is going to cut into the wood. So. I was excited to find this because it was kind of unique looking, and again, I don't know if you're going to really be able to pick up on this, but there's some odd, like it's not, it's rough, it's rough down here, and I thought, oh, maybe that's hand forged, but then I looked at the handle and it's like, well, that's kind of new looking to me, new, like, this isn't, this isn't an 18th century tool, this is probably something made in the 70s on up. So I couldn't figure out what it was. So I put a post up on Instagram asking if anybody had seen it all like this. And within like 10 minutes, uh, our good friend Phil Rivara responds and says, looks like a bearing scraper to me. And I was so focused on woodworking, I wasn't thinking of machine tools. Yeah, it, it looks exactly like a bearing scraper. Although a bearing scraper would not have these sides uh, reduced. It would just be one. Um, so this each plane here would just continue down without interruption. So you wouldn't have the, the spearhead on it, essentially. And looking at it, I realized that's why it's so rough. Somebody took a bearing scraper and took it to a grinding wheel and ground off the uh, these areas to make that spearhead point. Why, I don't know, uh, but it is what it is. So we've got ourselves a bearings, modified bearing scraper that I am going to clean up and use as a bird cave, y'all. <laughs> but it was, it was great. I love when, when you can actually figure out what something was originally and you know, what it was for, the history of it. I'm not going to get very far with this other than the fact that it was a bearing scraper that was modified. It's kind of cool that somebody took the time to do that. And now I'm going to use it for maybe a different purpose, maybe the same purpose. So that was tool number two. We're up to a grand total of $2 now. And then I really broke the bank, overshot my budget, whatever, whatever the term is. 
with the next item. And this is this has turned out to be really cool. This is the last one. Two dollars on this one. It's a file. I don't buy a lot of uh, flea market files because they tend to be dull and rusted and all that. But this one is actually in pretty good condition. It needs to be cleaned. It's got some gunk on it in some spots. It'll come off. It's really sharp. When I when I rub my finger on it, I can feel it biting. It's actually I don't think this is if this has been used, it's been used very little. Um, and what I like most about it is the profile. It's got this very nice tear teardrop profile, which is great for like getting into areas like um, the transition area. This spot here. Or uh, if you're making a saddle stem, the you know that, that transition. So I really think this is going to be a great file. It's fine, but it, it's a it seems like it's an aggressive cut. It is um, identified. <clears throat> it's got a stamping on it. Oh, by the way, it's also got this unique white paint here, which I thought when I picked it up, I thought, oh, somebody dipped it in paint. Uh, somebody did, but they did it at the factory. It turns out stamping on it is uh, Heller, the horse, and then it says New Cut, Made in USA, Cross Cut, I think. It's a cross cut. And uh, I can't read the stamping without a magnifying glass. It's too faint. So I, I had never heard of Heller. And Heller is um, quite, a, quite an interesting company. They made files, they made hammers. U.S. space company, I believe it was in Ohio, I believe. Maybe Colorado. I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot where the company was based. But I wanted to find out more about this because I'd, I'd like to know what the shape is, first off, just because if I want another one of these. <clears throat> and secondly, it seems to be a really good quality file, so I wanted to know more about this Heller company. So I'm, I'm Googling around looking for stuff on this. And I came across a Facebook group that is devoted to Heller Tools. Um, so unfortunately, the company is no longer existing. They no longer make files. But this gave me an opportunity to join this group and, and post some pictures and say, do you know anything about it? Somebody got back to me very quickly. Uh, one person sent me a catalog link. The other person said, that's a saw for sharpening crosscut, I'm sorry, a file for sharpening crosscut saws. So I looked at this and I, I read that and I thought, that doesn't make any sense because I sharpen saws and this is my largest saw sharpening file. There's a bit of a problem here. But he gave me a clue. By the way, what, what he actually said was, it's a great American pattern cross-cut saw sharpening file. I thought, the way I read that, that this was a great American pattern file. That was the name of the file shape. And it was used to sharpen cross-cut saws. No. What actually happens, and I'll, I'm going to show you some pictures here, is that it's used to sharpen very large crosscut saws. So hopefully I can get rid of pictures. Yes. You might be familiar with this. It's a one-man uh, crosscut saw for cutting logs. And uh, the one that you might be more familiar with, if I can get the darn picture to advance here, are the two-man crosscut saws. Uh, again, used to cut up logs after a tree has been felled. So these can be filed in a number of patterns, but one of the patterns which you see here in the lower uh, lower left is the Great American pattern, the Great American Tooth in this image. And the file that I showed you is actually used for this because the sort of narrow side of it, the top of that teardrop, can get into those uh, groups of three teeth that you see and it can file the edges of those teeth in a cross-cut fashion. The other end is used for cleaning out that gullet that you see between each of those groups of three. 
which is important for chip clearance. So yeah, it's actually a, oops, sorry about that, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> it's actually a, uh, a file specifically for sharpening those large crosscut saws, either one man or two man. And that's, that's pretty cool. The other neat thing about this is it probably was made in 1970 at the latest, based on the stampings, but I can't be sure about that. Uh, although the company was out of business by like 76, so. <laughs> or at least they were no longer manufacturing files under the Heller name. So, yeah, a little bit of history, learned a new thing about, uh, about saws and saw sharpening, and I'm still going to use it for... Uh, pipe me because it's what I need it for <laughs> so there you have it folks I, I hope you enjoyed that it was uh, a little off the normal track for me but I I love this kind of stuff I love old tools and by old they don't have to be hundreds of years old they can just be 40 years old and I'm happy and uh, I just love the, the investigative work that you bring something home, you clean it up, you try to find out what it is, you, who made it, what was it used for. It's fun. It's a hobby. Keeping me out of the bars. So, for the rest of today, got a little bit of yard work, going shopping, going out to breakfast with my wife, then we're going to go shopping. It'll be nice. And then, uh, when I get back home, I don't know, stuff. We'll see. Trying not to plan a lot for today. Back to work tomorrow. So with that, folks, I hope you had a uh, fantastic weekend. Uh, you're enjoying your Sunday, and you're looking forward to the week ahead. And until we speak again, I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Bye now. Mm -hmm.